again, everyone. I'm Rebecca Jones Gaston with the state of Maryland, and I have the pleasure of talking about evidence from a child welfare leader perspective. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's really important for us as child welfare leaders, and also then how do we do it. Um, so we get lots of questions all the time as a child welfare leader um, at all levels from all sorts of folks who want to know what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, or why can't we do something different? And so uh, we've had those questions that we've had to answer related to the 4E waivers for those states that went forward with those, related to our CFSR, our PIPs, and the upcoming opportunity under Family First. Lots of questions about how, why, what, when, and why not. Um, and so as a leader, we have to figure out a how to sort through all of the questions. But I think what's really important for us in leadership is figuring out the where. And that leads me to be thinking about data, evidence, information as a story. And what is the story that we want to tell? And what is the map and the, for the path that we need to do or follow to get to where we believe we need to be as a system? And so the first place, the first place we start is what is going on with our own system, our own agency? What's happening? What is it that the numbers are telling us? But sometimes even more importantly, what is it that our workforce is telling us? What is it that our communities are telling us? Our fellow agencies and partners, and probably the most important is our families, children, and youth that we're working with um, and on behalf of. And so we need to talk to each other and figure out what's going on. And somewhere in the middle, there's kind of what the, what the reality is and the picture of where we are. And then what we need to do together is think about where is it that we want to be collectively? And put a stake in the ground, a line in the sand, however you phrase it, and say, OK, so how do we get here? And then it's a series of questions. And that, for me, is what I find really is what, when we're talking about evidence, data, and information, it's what are the questions that we're asking, what are the answers that we need to make decisions, and what are the additional questions that we need to be asking. And so thinking about that, we as agencies and systems, we have lots of rules. In case you haven't noticed, there are lots of rules. And there's lots of rules about what we are supposed to do, what we have to do, and probably even more rules about what we can't do. And so in child welfare, we can't share information about what's happening in our system. From education, we can't share information about the education information related to kids. For juvenile services, we can't share information about what's happening with children being served in juvenile services. And from communities, sometimes it is we can't share information because we don't know what you're going to do with it. And so we need to be able to have the conversations that sorts through all of that and also push ourselves to not be allowed to be stuck in the barrier and just say, oh, well, we can't do it. Because guess what? There are all sorts of things in our systems that are working towards trying to align and remove some of the barriers. So we've got to figure it out. We've got Family First coming. We've had the Educational Stability and Success Act happening. We have the CWIS. And you know it's the acronym Comprehensive Child Welfare Information System. So those really technical sort of things are pushing us in our field to be thinking about how are we actually engaging with each other our stakeholders and our partners differently. We need to know all of this, not just because it's interesting, although it oftentimes is, but we're, we have limited resources. We have limited money. We have limited staffing. 
we have limited capacity to actually do some of the things that we're talking about. And you heard Alicia talk about all the various things that go into levels of evidence and practices. And they oftentimes don't align with what our workforce and our community partners are actually set up to be able to do. And so those are really important questions. And the bottom line is we still have some compliance requirements. We have to be able to be accountable for what we're getting from our federal partners, from our state partners, how are we using the resources that we're having, and then how can we actually answer those questions that I listed earlier in regards to what are we doing, how are we doing it, why are we doing it, and why not, and also when. There's always the when. And so if you don't take anything else away from the conversation today, I think we can we need to land really confidently on, we can't do any of this without having lived experience at the table with us, actually saying what's needed and driving what those decisions and questions are. And so I wanna share a little bit of an example of some of the things that we've been doing in Maryland. I'm a very visual person. I actually like data. I don't like to have to be the one to do the math or all the analysis, but I love this concept of data and evidence and the questions that it raises. And so my team has been actually very gracious in figuring out that Rebecca needs pictures. So I probably wouldn't have said at the beginning of my career that I was going to be this far along in my career and say, I need storybooks. I need a picture book to be able to tell a story. But that really is ultimately how you create some shared understanding about what the evidence is telling us to do, what we're doing, and where we're going. And so they create pictures that can have arrows going up, arrows going down, and figuring out, is it good that it's going up? Or do we want that arrow to go down? Being able to have those questions, not just at the leader of the agency level, but with all leaders within, all of your um, staff and team members within the organization. And again, most importantly, talking with the people that we're partnering with and those that we are serving. And sometimes that means we are saying, yeah, we're not really doing this as well. Because guess what we do know about foster care? We know at an aggregate, it doesn't work. So we talk about adding evidence-based practices, evidence-based interventions, but the one thing we do know, foster care doesn't work. So the quandary we have as agency leaders is, okay, so I'm leading an organization doing something that we know doesn't work. How do I get to doing something that does work. And that means we're gonna have to partner with other organizations. And I think actually partner with folks that have nothing to do with child welfare. Corporate world has all sorts of ways of looking at um, interventions, strategies, change strategies and transformation. Um, the medical field, but also we can't lose sight of the important pieces that Renda shared with us is that we know that much of the evidence that we rely on every day is actually built from information gathered about people that don't actually look like most of the families and the communities that we're serving. That's probably why foster care doesn't work. We're applying a science and evidence to something that it wasn't actually intended to cure. So we have to revisit in some ways what our questions are and thinking differently about how we are actually gonna push ourselves outside of the boundaries of some of the science and some of the parameters that our systems have built and really be able to look differently. Now let's be clear. I'm not saying let's throw evidence-based practices out the window. That's not what I'm saying at all. But let's know what the limitations are and ask the questions, put some things in place and partner around evidence 
building and accept a, a definition of evidence that isn't just have we done a comparison? Have we done a blind study? Because what we know, which is really how child welfare field grew, is there are a lot of promising practices out there that sit within communities, sit within um, other organizations, sit within families in a way that actually has impact and change that we just haven't figured out how to put a data set to, but is really powerful and impactful. So looking for ways for how we, as we get better at being able to say what we're doing is actually expected to have an impact, we need to do that. But we also need to think about where are our gaps and what is it that we need to build and how do we not intentionally or unintentionally set ourselves up to be limiting what the possibilities are for what we can actually do to help and support the communities. Because last I checked, children don't live on their own. I have evidence in my house of that. Families don't live in, in single homes in any shape or form by themselves without others around them. And communities, there's not just one community in the world. There's multiple communities. And so our work, our evidence, our decisions have to actually represent the fact that there's all this interconnectedness and interdependency and opportunities for us to continue to grow and learn in our field by using what we've learned and figuring out how do we continue to learn in ways that we've been limited before.